So today uh, we're going to do a little bit of immersive audio with uh, Andres and Martin. Um, and I've got my colleague here, Brian. My name is Greg. I'm with uh, Sennheiser's Customer Development and Applications Engineering. And we have Brian Glasscock here who's going to do a little introduction uh, from our AMBIO team. Brian? Cool. Well, thanks everybody for joining. This is going to be the first and hopefully a series of immersive audio discussions um, with leading practitioners from around the world, kind of talking about projects they're working on, different artistic questions, aesthetic questions. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're really excited to open up a discussion uh, for the community that's not just focused on tools and workflow, but also kind of a broader discussion about what immersive audio looks like and what, you know, what kind of choices people are making and how people are thinking about the work that they're doing. So, Thank you very much to Andres and Martin for, for joining us for this first one. Um, just want to give a little, a little introduction. Um, Andres Mayo is the former president of the AES, the Audio Engineering Society. He's an audio engineer and music producer who's worked on the art of mastering since 1992. He's boasts credits in more than 3,000 albums released in vinyl, CD, Blu-ray, streaming, and 360. I think that's all of them. I guess there's no cassette on that list, Andres. But uh, <laughs> he won, he's won two Grammy Awards seven Gardell Awards for Technical Excellence. He's a member of the P&E Wing, of uh, the Advisory Council at the Academy of the Recording Sciences. He also runs his own company, Andres Mayo, Mastering an Audio Post, and is the founder of 360 Media Music Lab, a company devoted to the production of immersive audio. Um, Martin Muscatello is a music produ producer based in Buenos Aires. After graduating from EMBA, he joined, joined the staff of El Paye Recording Studio, where he earned credits in a large number of albums. Today, he runs his own facility in El Mejor Studio. He is part of the 360 Mu Music Lab with Andres, developing and researching immersive audio, producing 360 audio content. And he's also a professor at the Escuela de Musica de Buenos Aires uh, in the music production two and mixed three academic areas. So we're really excited to start this conversation and start this series with Andres and Martin. Um, and they'll be talking about this album project that they're working on, which is focused on producing an album specifically for immersive audio in mind. Um, and so we're really excited. Basically the format today, it's gonna to be pretty flexible. Andres and Martin are gonna present about the project. You know, you can, we can take questions in the chat or in the Q&A functionality. So feel free to throw those in. We'll, we'll be monitoring those and bringing those to the presenter. Um, and then just also uh, to note, we will be recording this session. So I just wanna give everyone a fair warning on that. Uh, and we'll talk to Andres and Martina about how, how and if we can make that available later, but we're just going to record it for now. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so just, just be aware of that. I think that's it. Andres and Martin, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're really excited, you know, to have you join us for the first one. Um, and, you know, we're, we're excited to hear more about your project. So. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. And uh, of course, thanks for a great introduction. Um, <clears throat> we're excited to be here and honored as well because uh, we know that Sennheiser is doing a big, big push <clears throat> on the 360 uh, world and uh, of course it's great to to share all we're doing here and we, we have been doing it in the past for I would say the past three years now. Uh, we started the 360 Music Lab project uh, out of something that was coming up when uh, I personally did uh, was co-chairing the um, Audio for Virtual and Augmented Reality Conference for the AES. That was back in 2016. And at that time, I realized that there were a number of uh, big companies producing or developing software and hardware for 360 or for something that was called Audio for Virtual Reality in that at the time, we thought that virtual reality was going to be very big in, 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 in a matter of months. And it happened not to be that way, but still 360 Audio has been uh, growing up ever since. And um, so I discovered there were a number of people, uh, great companies, like I said, uh, working to, to, to develop this field and uh, companies from, you know, from the States, from Europe, from Korea, and that drove my attention. I, I realized that this was going to be big, but uh, the main thing that we were witnessing at that point was, uh, okay, this is like a technology demo. It's something that uh, we see 
in many cases that it's just showing what the technology can do for you, but it's not used in a very musical way. So we found a lot of examples of that. We then created 360 Music Lab to make our own project, to, to, to make it feel like it was not just technology or not just you know, a demo of what the, the, the product can do, for, can do for you, but also make it musically. Uh, make, make, it, make it musical, it would be the, the right expression. So basically uh, what I'm seeing here is that um, as far as we're being able to uh, move on so far, um, the, the, the main issue we found is, okay, how do we create music in 360 that is uh, believable, is, um, I would say, friendly in, in the sense that it attracts people and make people want to hear it again and not just, okay, like with many examples of the so-called 8D music we have uh, seen here and there, uh, it's like, okay, you get excited for 10 seconds or 30 seconds and then you say, well, what's, what's this? What, what else is going to happen? We don't want that. We, we want to create something that is actually uh, a new way of listening to music and it doesn't need to compete with the stereo or mono versions or any other version that can be out there. It's just uh, meant to create a different form, um, probably aiming to a niche, and it's probably going to be a niche that grows up in the next uh, five or <coughs> 10 years. But it doesn't mean that it, it will replace stereo music or surround music or any other form. So what we found is that it's extremely complicated, uh, I would say, way more than I expected to create music that is uh, that, that that belongs to both worlds in the same uh, at the same time when I say both both worlds what do I mean it's basically there are people who are expecting you know everything to fly around all the time and that's what they call 360 or AD or whatever and that's you know like we said technology demonstration uh, so there are a number of people who are expecting things to happen in that way because otherwise they won't recognize the difference between a normal stereo a well panned or open as we call it a stereo mix and a 360 mix and we want them to find the difference and be able to recognize it and appreciate it so there has to be something different on the other hand musicians people with well-trained ears people like you guys most likely uh, will be able to recognize the difference instantly and will get bored and will get even disgusted by the <laughs> fact that people, uh, that, that, that things are, objects are moving around all the time. So we don't want that either. So staying somewhere in the middle has been very, very difficult because of course it changes for every mix, changes for every song. And um, it happened to be one of the most tricky things in our three years period uh, research. Yeah, uh, I've actually, we started uh, trying and uh, testing some tools using uh, projects that were not uh, exactly musical. So the, there were uh, advertisements and um, yeah, um, probably um, some, some projects uh, for, for launch events for, for some products. So the, the client was aiming for that uh, experience uh, popcorn, we call it popcorn experience because it's like it's exploding uh, every little bit of the technology. So everything actually flies around and, and creates that sort of experience. But those were projects, uh, first, they, they were projects that weren't that long, so like a minute or so. So maybe in that uh, time frame, you can put everything together in that uh, short time and it actually works, but when it came it came to to music production, uh, we found ourselves. We both have music backgrounds, so we found ourselves fighting against the idea to use the, the technology to to create a product that was not fine, uh, refined, or or uh, musical. And the, our first tries were actually using the tool, the tools, the set of tools and techniques that we tried uh, along the way. Uh, very lightly, lightly or, or um, taking care that the music uh, itself didn't uh, suffer, suffer, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, 
those were actually good experiences, but we found out that the, it was what the, uh, Andres was just saying, that it was not enough to take uh, uh, the mix and make it itself apart from the stereo or regional mix or for, for any other stereo mix for that matter. And then we went to the other side of the spectrum, all the way, and we were fighting against, we were all the, all the time working, looking at their, uh, to each other and saying, isn't this too much? <laughs> I mean, isn't this too much to, to, to the cello to fly across the room? It, it's so unnatural, so unmusical. And all this because we found some examples on, on, the, web, on the web, on the social networks that were uh, very popular, actually, we we received some uh, audio samples uh, on WhatsApp, on Instagram, uh, that were these uh, products show showing products, showing technology, and musically they were not so good for us anyway. And we showed it to a fellow musician and producers, and the collective opinion was that yeah, it I mean it's interesting for like the first 10, 20 seconds, and actually, and then it gets more, and it has something to do with the song. So our challenge in the end was to, to use this technology to enrich the music and to make the artists feel uh, re well represented. And I think we are we're getting to a point where we can actually show a mix and feel in the middle, in, right in the middle where we feel the technology is serving the music uh, artistically and, and it's a, a good moment to, to start showing the material. Yeah, the, the the concept for for this album we produced, we are in the middle of produ producing, but almost finished, um, was that uh, we need to create from scratch. Okay, we don't want to depend on on things that have been produced before and then take it, take them to a 360. But you know, start from scratch. In many many cases, we started from just a raw uh, multi-track or even recorded stuff. But the thing was. Um, all we had in mind was to take advantage of the 360 format, not just in the mix, but also in the production concept and in, even in the recording in, in many cases. So we went from a stereo, uh, not a stereo, actually a surround mix that we did here in the studio. And we played, uh, we played stems through that uh, stereo uh, surround uh, mix, and then we re-recorded, um, uh, recaptured that, uh, like did, did some kind of reamp uh, using an ambisonics mic, like the Ambio. So uh, that proved to be very helpful because even though it changed the color, because we were reamping, of course, uh, we have the ability of uh, really. Uh, zooming in that particular part of the mix and basically doing whatever we wanted with that. So that's that's a trick. That's a, a technique we used. We also used a uh, binaural head. We used uh, extensively the DRVR software and we have been able with all that to uh, <clears throat> first experiment and get, I mean, different scripts you know, when I say scripts, I mean like in the movie. I mean, a script is something like, okay, uh, in this part of the song, we will do this, and then we will do this, and then, you know, the cello is going to come here, and the drummer is going to be there, and the solo, and the guitar solo will be here, like that. So that's a script, but it, that's divided on, uh, on a, like in the time frame, we, we use the intro for a certain movement or a certain uh, positioning, then uh, the verse will be something different, then the, the chorus will be different, bridge, etc. That's a way of dividing the script. Just one second. Uh, and, and, and then uh, the other way is to divide the script in terms of frequency response, because we want to make sure that uh, since instruments behave differently, uh, depending if they are in the in the in the upper side of the spectrum, like you know a hi hat, or lower end like a, a bass, uh, of course the bass will tend to be uh, omnidirectional, and you don't expect the bass to be flying around like probably um, you know some percussion or some something with really uh, fast transients. So depending on what part of the spectrum we're talking about, we also divide the script considering 
the, those, uh, those elements. I mean, the, 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 the way they behave in the spectrum. And the third way is considering uh, what the instrument uh, means for that particular music. Because like Martin said, it has to be musical. It has to be something that is meaningful for the artist. It's not just, okay, that's what we did. We flew around everything and here's your mix. Uh, no, the artist will have to feel that it's still his own uh, voice or her own voice and uh, it, it will still be representing his or her music in a way, in a different way, but it still has, has to be personal. So it's very, very important that we keep track of all that. And when we construct that script, it has to consider all those elements. We will show an example and probably you'll see what, uh, what we mean. Since this is not the best way to share it because the Zoom uh, audio will not be good enough for that, we'll share the link on, on the screen here for in the chat and you'll be able to download it and have a listen. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the audio quality is very important that indeed, um, we'll get back to that in a moment, but uh, uh, adding to what Andres just said, the script turned out to be almost the most important thing uh, to, to, the, to the mix, to the concept of a mix, because um, in a traditional mix or uh, traditional, traditional song where um, there's a, a vocalist and a set of instruments, a band and an structure to a song like an intro, uh, verse, uh, chorus and so on. So we, ha we, ha we have this uh, like predisposition to listen a certain type of, or, of a structure or, or, or a balance between instruments. That is not a bad thing because I mean, I, I don't mean it a bad thing. We, we, we are used to some kind of a pattern in music. And this um, mixing in this uh, 360 environment, um, we need to make sure like we keep musical. And at the and the same time, we can use this distribution, this structure changing, and um, kind of, uh, um, I mean, um, yeah, no, I mean the, the 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 role it takes for every instrument in in certain part of the song, so we can make a different scene to each part. So. We find it very fun actually to 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 script the, the verse in in some way and make focus on some specific instrument maybe the vocals first uh, or maybe uh, um, guitar solo afterwards but also maybe an instrument that doesn't get the spotlight in a in a traditional song like a, a percussion set or or a keyboard that is not playing any particular melodic pattern just a just a, a, a harmonic pad or something like that. So uh, we like using the different elements in a non-traditional way so as to create a, a an evolving experience along the way. So when you get to the end of the song, we, you didn't feel like anything repeated itself and you want to listen to it again so you can experiment again, sort of in, like in a movie where uh, you don't see the same thing twice unless it's, a, it's a, like a, a, you remember something or something like that. So uh, yeah, script turned out to be the, the key to, to making an interesting mix. And along the, that strip, using different elements in a certain way to, to, to make every part specific uh, and not, not repeating a certain pattern. And also uh, one of the, the important things that we found was that uh, we, the set of tools and techniques we, we were gonna use had to be very well thought in terms of the playback and distribution platforms because we started thinking about uh, using some tools that were limited in terms of uh, playback um, distri uh, distribution platforms. First, when, when mixing with surround systems, uh, we found that it wasn't going to be very likely for everyone to, to listen to it properly because not everyone has a proper uh, surround system at their house. Um, and as surround systems become more and more complex, that probability even decreases. So uh, we find that Ambisonics as a technology, as a, con as a, as a system, is great because it's open source and it's been adopted by different um, platform, platforms and, and social networks and YouTube, Facebook, and, and so on. But also we, 
so that music is all, all, almost always listened in stereo systems and more than ever in headphones with mobile devices and people going around with their headphones on all the time. So binaural playback was like the most, the biggest uh, target. And we ended up using uh, a rendering to, to binaural instead of other formats um, for music, at least for music uh, for this project. Uh, we have the mixes, we, we have open mixes where we can actually create a, an ambisonic render or, or even convert it to surround playback. But uh, binaural has become, or uh, binaural render, I mean, um, has become our goal for music production in most cases. Yeah, we want the music to be able to uh, to, to be viralized, uh, to, you know, stereophile is something that uh, is easy to reproduce, easy to, you know, transfer. And uh, it's also uh, um, withstanding the, the compression of the codex quite well. Uh, of course, if you go on Spotify and Spotify uh, allows you to, to listen in the worst quality, which is 128 kilo, kilo, uh, kilobits per second, um, you won't hear it because it will be very distorted. It won't, you will lose all the 3D effect. So it wouldn't be a good thing. But if you go 3, 320, then it's probably quite, I mean, it's good enough. So uh, even YouTube or other streaming services that are pretty, I mean, you can rely on that to viralize your own music. So that's a good thing. You don't depend on a huge listen environment or, you know, 20, uh, speakers or things like that that nobody will have in their homes. You can just rely on uh, earbuds, and that's pretty pretty good. And uh, the the interesting thing of the mix we're going to show you in a minute is that um, this is not the mix that actually will go public because we thought that this was a kind of intermediate uh, step where we wanted to show the changing point of view of the ambisonics mic. Of course, this is recreated from nothing because there, were, there was no uh, recording room. Uh, musicians never got together. So this is entirely uh, recreated uh, by software and also hardware. But mostly uh, what we tried to do is to go from the drummer seat to the uh, singer's mic and then to position you know, the drummer on the far end and uh, you know the guitar solo and cello things that you will hear but in a way that is probably like you will hear in the room if you were changing your, your point of view so this is actually a little bit extreme in a way because we did something that we thought it, uh, afterwards we thought it was not completely musical so we changed it for a new mix that is the one that will go public in probably in a week uh, but this one is interesting because it shows you what you will be hearing if you were in the drummer seat and you had, you know, the singer uh, going around you and with a little bit of processing in her voice. And then you go all the way to her mic and you hear every, everything else and the voice in the first, in the first uh, person. So, uh, I mean, it's inter interesting to, to listen to and to see what can be explored from here. It's just an example. It's something that probably uh, still is a, a, a few steps from being completely finalized. But the thing is that we've gone a, a long way making it believable, enjoyable, and uh, most of all, uh, it's, uh, it's a nice 360 experience for all who wants to, to, to listen. Andres, I, I have a question to start. Um... This is Brian here. Um, you're, you're talking about having to balance the kind of 3D effect and musicality um, and kind of having to learn what that balance is between, you know, doing a demo and producing something that people, you know, have a certain expectation for what a music recording sounds like, right? Um, how, how, how do you find that balance and kind of where, where do you feel that balance is? And do you think there's still exploration to be done there between you know, kind of 3D going over the top of 3D and, and um, you know, musicality. I, I, I guess it's kind of a hard place to navigate, it seems like. 
it's very hard and we it's not it's not a, a, a path we're going we're going through completely yet because we know that there is a lot more to explore and it's probably never finished uh, because it's it will change in every mix and every song but uh, the main thing is to remember that you still have a background as a music producer and you still are producing music not just uh, you know technology because it, it, it you can easily change your your focus here and say okay we have all these tools great tools let's go and do this and this and this and well okay it's the same i compare it uh, with with when we started with the surround music recording and, and mixing and we were, wanted to fly everything around and the thing was that at the end of the day the, the stereo mix was better than the surround mix and that doesn't have to to happen so I would say that the first thing is to remember who is the artist you're working with, what is his his or her background, what, where does he or he or she come from, and uh, what are we trying to show with this? Not to show, probably the the the, the word wouldn't be show would be uh, what we're trying to communicate or what is the emotion behind it. As long as we keep the emotion intact, or even we make it even bigger or better then we are in the right track otherwise we're lost in technology yes yeah also uh, when um the other day when we are we are um discussing a mix we just finished actually it was this one uh we we share it with some colleagues um and some of them um i mean we had all sorts of different opinions whereas when you share a traditional stereo mix you probably get some opinions that have to do with one another. And I think that um, that happens because there is no, this is a starting point. Like Andres said, when, when find point, find that one was starting as a mixed format, um, there was a little, a little reference to, to, to consult in terms of uh, if this is something that uh, we are used to listening to. But in, now we are starting in the 360 music, um, format and we don't have we, do, we really don't have any reference so we cannot compare to any other mixes and and no one can so our colleagues may think they like it or may think they don't like it but it it it, a lot of, it all ends up as a subjective opinion so we have to uh go with our gut feeling so uh, like andres just said if we know the artist and we we, the artist feels like he is represented and uh, his mix talks to talks for him and uh, well I mean those are the things that we need to 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 consult our our experience as producers and the artists uh, feeling about the mix and let's hope that everyone else enjoys it as well as we do but there is no point of reference as in a mysterious mix because there is no history to it yeah, it's a wild west, as we call it. I mean, it's nothing is uh, carved on stone, and we know that we're experimenting, but still we are ahead of the of the the rest in many ways because we've been experimenting for three years. So, uh, I guess no one can say this is wrong or right. It's just a matter of subjective experience. And uh, we, what we learn here is that uh, it's absolutely difficult to comply or to cope with the, all the, 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 uh, the expectations that people may have about 360. There's a lot of people who won't care about 360 ever in their lives because it's just simply not appealing. Uh, but other people, especially younger generations, will be hoping that 360 or immersive audio or video will, uh, you know, define the their worlds for many reasons. So we're trying to cater for them and we're trying to do something that is actually uh, not just interesting, but also uh, re a redefinition of the way they will hear music. So that's that's the way we're trying to, to go. I just posted the the link so you can download the uh, the the mix, and we can share opinions, or otherwise it can be off offline as you as you want. There is a question. I don't know, Brian, if you want to read it. Uh, sure. Yeah, we can go. 
with another question. I, I'm happy to read it for you. So uh, one question we got is 360 audio and Dolby Atmos similar when you guys are talking about 360. Um, and uh, is uh, location-based rather mi than a mix for each speaker? Um, yeah, well, Atmos is um, mainly a system that um, ends up in a multi-speaker uh, playback system. Although it has its version for binaural and um, headphone playback, we tested it very thoroughly and we didn't find that uh, binaural rendering was good enough for, for as, a, as, a, as a main system for us. We, we did mix in, Ad, in Atmos very much uh, in the beginning, but in the end, when, when rendering to binaural, we didn't feel like the, 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 the moves and the positions were as natural as we wanted to, to, to feel in comparison to other systems. Uh, but um, yeah, so Atmos is an object-based system and it's uh, speaker independent in that sense because we can play a playback uh, in any sort of system as long as you have it well calibrated. Uh, but um, our mixes are, are um, we're going to show you a screen, a screen share of the session now. Uh, basically we are using in this case a Dear VR plugin to position uh, the instruments in certain point in space and move around and play with the uh, dimensions and reverbs. reverbs. Um, but it's, uh, it's not object based in that sense. It's, uh, it's, it, all, it, it all ends up in a binaural render within the, 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 the DRVR system. So uh, I don't think it works in the same way for, for, uh, in, in a technical um, definition sense. Brian, I don't know, or oh, Stuart, I'm sorry, I don't know if there are more questions, uh, if you want to. Yeah, know. sorry, I, I can give a quick summary about what, what we've been talking about in the chat. Uh, Stuart asked a couple questions about, um, you know, what could be enabled if, say, a pair of headphones, you know, in this, our, our competitor Bose, for example, makes headphones with head trackers in them, right? Um, and And I guess, you know, this comes to the interesting question is like, you know, you can distribute something as static binaural and you don't have the full interactivity of, you know, moving your head like you would get, say, in like an Oculus VR experience where, you know, you have the live ambisonics renderer. Um, and I think you raised an interesting question. It's like there are starting to be more headphones or accessories on the market that have head tracking, though it seems like.
Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.